Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Start uh, lecture 39 with our discussion on Bubnov Galatkin finite element method in solving an elliptic equation with linear basis function. And uh, when we go through this uh, weak formulation, the spatial derivative term appears like a CD2 expansion, and this has uh, erroneously been uh, uh, pointed out by various uh, people, but we want to state unequivocally that this bubnov galakin method provides a much better dispersion relation than the equivalent FDM. <coughs> we also notice that this bubnov galakin method has the energy conservation property and we can uh, as we mentioned that uh, we can look at the 1D convection equation and work out the dispersion relation property of this and uh, as usual we can uh, take the FEM method in the wave number plane and find out k equivalent by k for this and find out what is the spectral resolution achieved by this finite element method and uh, what is the added dissipation. We note that uh, for the inter internal elements, bubnov galakin method uh, is uh, non-dissipative. Uh, however, uh, near the boundary, we will have to have uh, one-sided elements and that essentially leads to the problem, exactly similar problems that we faced in uh, the compact schemes. And this has been uh, variously attempted in uh, various versions of petrov galakin method, uh, SUPG or streamline upwind petrov galakin method of Hughes and his colleagues uh, fall in this category. Uh, one of the aspect of this uh, SUPG method is in choosing the streamwise uh, diffusion parameter that is built in into the method and uh, uh, this has been done following some classic work for uh, once again a 1D convection equation, but unfortunately this diffusion parameter has been designed for a method for which one assumes that there is no error in time discretization. Uh, using those values of uh, streamwise diffusion parameter, we can uh, obtain the real and imaginary part of k equivalent by k of SCPG method and work out the numerical amplification factor. We can uh, notice that uh, this is a very dissipative method and which uh, will not be able to solve 1D convection equation at all. So, that is why we investigate uh, the quadratic basis uh, function uh, based uh, Galerkin method, look at its boundary treatment and compare various uh, results of uh, uh, linear basis function based uh, FEM, the quadratic uh, basis function FEM and the SUPG method. And with this, we will conclude uh, this lecture. So, let us uh, begin. Uh, recall that uh, in the last class, we started uh, looking at an example of this kind, <coughs> how we apply uh, linear Galerkin uh, type of uh, method is uh, displayed here. So, what you write is uh, u as a linear combination of uh, the basis functions as given here times the nodal values, right. And uh, if you recall in the weighted residual met method, we had to choose the weight function which we called as w j. In Bubnov Galerkin uh, approach, that uh, w j is nothing but uh, phi j itself, right. So, uh, what then happens is uh, then you uh, substitute this into this, then multiply by the weight and then integrate and this is what you get. This is what we were doing in the last class. So, <coughs> we are not satisfying the differential equation as it is, we are uh, satisfying its uh, weighted residual to be equal to 0, that is what is the weak form is. Now, 
Uh, what happens is, uh, we also noted that uh, this basis function phi of j that we have taken here, uh, they are linear. If they are linear, then uh, of course, uh, you will not be able to support a second derivative. That is where uh, integration by part come to your rescue. You can spread this uh, requirement on second derivative uh, by doing integration by parts and this is what you get. And the first derivatives are uh, um, obtained if you look at uh, your uh, basis functions like this. So, one of which is basically minus h and this is 1 over plus h and uh, what? This was the jth node, this is j plus 1 th node. So, this curve belongs to phi j, whereas this curve belongs to uh, phi j plus 1, right? That is the way we had uh, done. And then, uh, so we substituted in here and then we will see that uh, uh, this j goes from 1 to n, but uh, you will find the contribution will come from j is equal to uh, L minus 1, L and L plus 1. <coughs> and using uh, this derivative information as uh, we have noted here, the derivatives are given like this. So, this is essentially your d phi j uh, dx and this is uh, d phi j uh, dx, uh, j plus 1, right. So, that is what we are doing. So, substituting that, this part, this part uh, comes down to u l minus 1 uh, minus 2 u l uh, plus u l plus 1 by h. Okay? <coughs> and then we have uh, this quantity phi. So, before closing yesterday, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, the second derivative uh, as it is here, this term uh, contributes uh, this term. And you can see that if I uh, divide it by h square, that is something like your uh, C D 2 kind of uh, representation for the second derivative, right. So, quite often than not, you will find in many books, they will say that it is a second order accurate representation, which is uh, misleading, because uh, you see, <coughs> although this looks like a C D 2 stencil, but this is not simply f of l, right. So, what you do actually uh, to obtain this term, you also uh, express uh, f of x in terms of uh, its uh, various uh, uh, Galerkin modes. Okay? So, those are those uh, nodal values of f j times uh, phi j you do and then you multiply by f of l and integrate over all possible j's. And once again, you will see that it is only that uh, the lth node and the neighbor on either side L minus 1 and L plus 1 will contribute and that contribution uh, is given here. <coughs> so, in the end, what you are getting is this is the discrete equation that you have. So, if you are doing a finite difference type of calculation, let us say uh, with the second order central scheme, then left hand side would be same, but on the right hand side you would have gotten simply f of l. But in this uh, bobnov galakin approach, you are getting some kind of a weighted uh, average of uh, f on the right hand side also. Well, um, this actually leads to enhanced uh, spectral accuracy in com comparison to any other discretization method and that we should be very easily be able to see, because the way we have developed our analysis tool, we can uh, figure that out. <coughs> but we uh, should also note some differences of why we are getting this uh, spectral accuracy, although it is not exactly like spectral method, because the error in F e m at the lth node is uh, not really orthogonal to basis functions. That is what we have seen. Uh, what happens is uh, increasing the number of basis uh, functions uh, n. Uh, alters uh, all the uj's. Uh, which uh, is the case for spectral method, but FEM it is a kind of a local adjustment. Okay? <coughs> um, 
despite this uh, non orthogonality of the basis function with the residue, uh, we do uh, use FEM because of its uh, uh, ease of coding and uh, getting the solutions and because of its local nature of the solution. Okay. <coughs> um, what is important for us to realize that if you are solving some problem of the kind which we have been dealing in this course, the kind of disturbance propagation, then we require a dispersion relation preservation property and we will uh, be able to show shortly that uh, FEM actually gives you a better DRP property than many other methods, uh, which is not always uh, appreciated. I will just skip this part. It just uh, tells you that um, this galactin FEM has this uh, unique uh, property of uh, preserving energy. Uh, it has been uh, shown here by a uh, <coughs> representation of evolution equation of this kind. So, whatever may be the equation after spatial discretization, you may be able to write it like this. And if you are solving in a domain uh, with x varying from a to b, and you do this uh, kind of uh, FEM kind of ex expansion in terms of the nodal values of u j of t. Uh, <coughs> what it uh, amounts to is uh, basically, if you multiply that equation by u, this is what you are going to get. <coughs> now, if you integrate it over the whole domain, left hand side gives you a kind of an estimate for the energy, right? Half u square is the energy. So, if you can um, show that uh, your u represented by some kind of a, a galactin uh, expansion in such a way that the right hand side is identically equal to 0, then you have uh, performed the energy uh, conservation. Uh, so, that is essentially this. So, basically after your spatial discretization, if uh, any function theta could be written like this, then you have achieved the energy conservation and this is what is actually uh, done in galactin method. So, that is why Galactin method continues to be a method of choice for uh, very uh, accurate calculations. Okay. Now, I mentioned that, uh, that we uh, do get better uh, dispersion relation preservation property of this Galactin FEM. So, let us uh, get back to our uh, um, 1D convection equation and then we go through this uh, expansion of U like this as we have indicated here and uh, <coughs> substitute it in the uh, governing equation and then integrate over the whole domain from A to B. And let us say we have n such uh, basis node, then the first term would give us this. So, you see all the time uh, derivatives would be uh, built in in this, because this is strictly a function of x, whereas this is a function of time. Okay. So, basically uh, the del u del t that partial would uh, result in the ordinary derivative d d t of uh, u j here. And once again you multiply by phi l, okay. uh, that would uh, come from this term, the first term and the second term is written over here. Now, this term we have already seen, this is like what we have just now done. See this uh, term we saw that this was nothing but one sixth of uh, f of L minus 1 plus uh, 4 F of L and this is F L plus 1. So, uh, this, uh, this term is exactly like uh, this term. Uh, think of F is nothing but duj dt and then you basically get this term as this. Okay. So, this is something that you notice that uh, in solving that 1D convection equation, uh, the time derivative is treated differently in FEM as compared to other methods, because you are now taking a weighted average of the time derivative from the lth node and that L plus minus 1 th node. Okay. So, this is a kind of a difference that we should have. Okay. Now, we can uh, estimate this term uh, slowly. Say for example, uh, we are integrating over all possible j. So, the contribution would come of course, from j equal to L and L plus minus 1. For example, um, if I take j is equal to L, then I will get uh, this term as phi L, d d x of phi L in this. So, that is like uh, u L by 2 d d x of phi L square d x. And uh, what do we get? Uh, we get uh, this, right? Uh, because the lth node is uh, 
if this is my uh, say the lth node, so then uh, what we are getting, this is the function. So, this goes from l minus 1 to l plus 1. So, that is what uh, where we have the uh, footprint of the node is from x l minus 1 to x l plus 1. And if we substitute it there, we will see that there would be a total cancellation and there is uh, no contribution coming uh, from l. Okay? So, that is why uh, we find that uh, j equal to l does not contribute to uh, for that integral uh, by any amount. Okay. <clears throat> Next, uh, look at the interaction of the lth node with the uh, left uh, node by taking j is equal to l minus 1 and we can uh, perform this integral, because we know what this uh, derivative is. Suppose, uh, we are looking at uh, say the lth node. So, this lth node is this and l minus 1 is this. So, this integral that we are uh, performing uh, here, l minus 1 interacting with lth node. So, this is your uh, l minus 1th node and this is your lth node. So, the interaction would uh, come only from this region. right? So, that would be nothing but uh, integrating from uh, this will be L minus 1 and this is x l. right? So, that is what uh, we do and what is uh, d phi l uh, minus 1 d x? That is this slope. right? So, this slope is what we know is minus 1 over h. right? So, I will uh, just simply uh, replace uh, this one by minus 1 over h and phi l expression we have written here and we will uh, see that would be this part phi l minus 1 would come from this path. So, that would uh, give you this quantity. Okay? So, I have not, I have omitted those steps, but you can uh, uh, do it yourself that that would uh, work out to u l minus 1 by 2. Or the same way you can uh, find out the contribution coming from l plus 1th node. So, that would be uh, this path. So, I am talking about uh, interaction that will come from this. So, this is the interaction between l and uh, l minus 1 and this one would be l and l plus 1. That is uh, what we are going to get and that would uh, give us u l plus 1 by 2. <coughs> so, uh, what really happens is that uh, your discrete equation for the convection equation turns out like this. Once again, you notice that uh, this is a familiar T d 2 kind of representation of del u del x term. But look at the time derivative, it is a kind of a uh, weighted uh, average of uh, u l uh, obtained from its uh, two neighbors as well. Uh, so, what happens is, uh, let us look at uh, um, how we can analyze it by representing this again in this kind of a uh, Fourier representation or Fourier Laplace representation. Um, at uh, x l, I would just simply uh, put the phase at i k x l and t dependence kept in capital U and substitute it in the uh, equation that we have it uh, here. So, we are going to write these as uh, uh, that uh, in this form okay? and then wherever I have x l plus 1, I will write it as i k x l plus i k h. So, those ones will contribute here. right? So, this uh, first term that you are seeing that contribution is coming from uh, u l plus 1 uh, the derivative time derivative. So, that is what that is equal to nothing but d u d t times e to the power i k h and the middle term is simply for uh, d u l d t. So, that is what we are getting there and uh, this term is of course, uh, uh, u l minus 1 d t okay? that term will give you e to the power minus i k h. Okay? And whereas, uh, the spatial derivative terms give you again u l plus 1 and u l minus 1. So, they, those give you this e to the power i k h minus e to the power minus i k h into u. So, basically then uh, rearrangement of this would lead you to this equation and what you notice is uh, then that it is equivalent to as if you have evaluated the derivative at the lth node itself which is given here and the rest of the term 
the product is nothing but what? It is your like I k equivalent, is not it? So, what happens is you are noticing that I k equivalent for F e m is not what you would have gotten from C D 2. C D 2 would have given you simply sin k h by h, right? Uh, 2 sin k h by h. But here, because of this weighted averaging of this term, you get this additional term in the uh, front here, 6 by 4 plus 2 cos k h. So, basically then this quantity that we have here is nothing but our k equivalent by k. Okay? So, what happens is, as a consequence, uh, you will find uh, that uh, in the interior nodes that uh, what we have uh, just now shown, uh, we get k equivalent by k, the real part goes like this. And let me uh, just point it out to you that uh, this is far, far more accurate than your C D 2 representation. If you would have taken a C D 2 representation, that would have started from one end, but that k equivalent by k curve would have been far below this. Whereas, you are uh, preserving that k equivalent by k uh, very far into uh, this k h range. It is more than uh, about 1.3, 1.4 uh, as compared to 0.25 to 0.3 for C D 2. Okay? Whereas, of course, uh, the imaginary part uh, you will not get anything because it is a kind of a central representation uh, and you do not have that. Only thing is you will have to do something more for the uh, nodes which are uh, at the end of the domain. Okay? Let us try to uh, uh, just explain it a bit. Suppose, this is my domain and this is my uh, first element, uh, uh, first and last element, we integrate it like this. The second element is of course, like this. So, the second element is a regular element with uh, two parts, but the first element only has this part, because what you want? that in this range, you want that everywhere this plus this should add up to 1 and that is what you get by having this. So, the same way for n minus 1 th node also, you would uh, get uh, this kind of a representation and this makes it uh, somewhat of a one sided uh, kind and that is what we are seeing here. If we evaluate that uh, differential equation for j equal to 1 or n, we get the stencil uh, uh, the discrete equation different and that would make uh, this real part uh, obtain a overshoot, whereas the imaginary part is uh, going to be of the following kind. <coughs> now, for this wave equation as we have seen going from left to right and because, so basically your convection direction is this and for this uh, the first node, uh, what you are getting the information you are getting it from inside and that leads to kind of a numerical instability and that is what is indicated by this imaginary part taking a very high value. Okay? So, at the inflow you have instability problem for the uh, F e m kind of representation. Whereas, if you look at uh, the last node, it is just the opposite. So, the, these two are basically nothing but uh, mirror image of each other. Okay? Uh, that, that is because of the central nature of the thing. But you understand that this is one of the drawback of uh, FEM, like seen even in compact theme, that if we are not careful in handling the near boundaries uh, points correctly, we may get into physical instabilities. Okay? However, um, what we could do is that is what I just uh, uh, shown you how you handle the first and last element, and then uh, you can actually perform the discretization from L equal to 2 to n minus 1 but you have to have a special treatment uh, like this. For example, uh, if I do that, what I just now explained, for L equal to 1, this is the discrete equation I would get and for L equal to n, I get this. Okay? And this is not uh, a symmetric uh, representation. You can see this is U L plus 1 minus U L and this is what I was saying that information is propagating in the wrong direction because you are sitting at L equal to 1 but the information is coming from L equal to 2 and which is a wrong uh, attribute uh, physically. Whereas, uh, for L equal to n, this is okay because you are going from inside the domain towards outside. So, that does not cause any problem. In fact, that causes extra dissipation. Okay? 
Uh, so, thus uh, we can conclude that the physics is somewhat violated uh, while adding the directionality at the last element. Okay. Now, uh, let us get back to this discussion of uh, uh, the dispersion property. We have uh, noted, we have noted here, this is uh, this. So, even if I write d u d t is equal to something like uh, your i omega times the transform. So, this equation would give you an expression for omega, right. That is what we are uh, saying here that the dispersion relation is uh, obtained, let us say by assuming that the time integration is uh, exact. So, d u d t I will just simply write as i omega u hat, right. So, that means that uh, omega is nothing but this factor that is what we obtained in that expression 50. Okay. So, basically once you have the expression for omega, you can uh, calculate uh, the corresponding uh, group velocity by taking d omega d k, but that would uh, uh, be somewhat artificial because we are uh, taking the time discretization to be exact, that is how we get it. However, what you could do is, uh, you could decide uh, having obtained uh, let us say discrete equation of this time, uh, what we have written here 50. Suppose, uh, we perform a Euler time integration, right. So, in each of this term, I will write it as uh, u l plus 1 at n plus 1 at time level minus u l plus 1 at n time level and then apply a uh, that Fourier Laplace transform, then we will get this g of my g of 1. What, why did I put it as a superscript within uh, uh, bracket 1 is because this is a p equal to 1 polynomial we have taken. We have taken a linear basis function. So, uh, we will uh, call that as g of 1 and substitute it there and do this analysis the usual way that we are familiar with now. This g of 1 comes out like this. Okay. So, what does this g of 1 uh, uh, represent, you can very clearly see what modulus of this will be greater than 1. So, this is going to be numerically unstable, right. So, that is one of the issue of uh, galaxy method. So, this uh, had created a lot of uh, problem for FEM development when you look at uh, unsteady problems. If you are doing let us say structures. Uh, uh, structural analysis where you are looking at steady state. That is where uh, Galactin methods uh, seems to have no problem because there is no time dependence coming. Is the problem comes when you have com coupled space time dependence and that is what uh, prompted the early practitioners who wanted to use finite element method in fluid dynamics uh, scenario. They realized that you will have to develop a methodology which will work when you have simultaneous space and time dependence and this is where uh, they gave up on bubnov galakin approach by uh, not taking this. So, what they did was they switched over to petrov galakin method and in petrov galakin method what you do is you do not use phi j equal to uh, sorry the w j equal to phi j you just uh, uh, give up that uh, option. Okay. <clears throat> so, anyway we will uh, talk about uh, this petrov galakin method a bit now. One of the most uh, used method uh, is that SUPG, it is called streamwise upwind petrov galakin method. Uh, this seems to uh, be used by many, many people. Uh, Let us uh, understand what this is. Uh, I will just uh, uh, quote some results. Uh, what you do is basically um, you take a weight functions, which is now not uh, like your uh, bubnov galakin method. In the bubnov galakin method, we took uh, w j as phi j. So, if I am looking at this, I have equal weightage coming from both the sides because this function is symmetric. In petrov galakin method, what they uh, instead say that uh, you uh, actually uh, look at the weight function, which should have higher weight upstream of the node than in the downstream. So, if let us say the information is propagating in this way, then I would perhaps take a function which will be skewed like this and which may be 
uh, weighted more heavily on the upwind side. So, this is your petrov galerkin kind of an approach. And if you do some such thing, which was done by once again by weather prediction people to begin with. So, they have uh, found out that there is another parameter that comes in that actually uh, gives this bias. Okay? So, this is your uh, uh, bubnov galerkin method and this is your petrov galerkin method. Okay? So, this two are petrov galerkin method and this is the bubnov uh, galerkin method. And this uh, biasing uh, in petrov galerkin method comes through this factor uh, parameter called beta, which is called the streamwise diffusion parameter. Now, uh, I am not going to go through this, it is a quite uh, elaborate uh, uh, area. There are um, thick uh, volumes written about this uh, method itself, so we will not uh, go about it. But what happens is, we get almost a similar thing, um, like what we had obtained for bubnov galerkin when it comes to c times del u del x term, that is exactly there, but you also get uh, this additional term, it is proportional to beta, the streamwise diffusion parameter. What you find, this is nothing but your second derivative. So, in the name of uh, upwinding uh, in this petrov galerkin method through this parameter beta is equivalent to actually adding dissipation to the back door. That is very evident from this term, right. This is nothing but your second derivative of u with respect to x that comes up. And uh, the time derivative has uh, the same structure as before, except that uh, you have 1 plus beta by 2 and here you have 1 minus beta by 2, but still uh, you get the weighting uh, similar. So, what you find that if you substitute beta equal to 0 in this equation, you get back to your Galerkin method. We also can uh, check it out that if we put beta equal to half, then that would be like what we had done for finite difference first order upwinding case. That is that's what we are uh, referring to here, that the first order upwinding uh, via finite difference gives us something like u l plus 1 u l by h. So, that is that would be uh, written equivalent to u l plus 1 minus u l minus 1 by 2 and then you will have to add this part up. Okay? And when you put beta equal to half, you will see that will exactly match. Right? So, you can see uh, that beta gives you additional degree of freedom to actually use petrov galerkin method. And this two gentlemen from weather prediction side, they did some analysis on uh, a wave propagation problem and they suggested that you choose beta equal to 0.26 and you get uh, pretty good results. Okay. Uh, we will see such uh, results uh, shortly, but before we do that, we can find out that this uh, petrov galerkin method that we are talking about gives us a k equivalent by k given by this function. Uh, previously, what you saw that this function was purely real, but because now we have resorted to upwinding, you will see it will become a complex quantity and that is what you are seeing uh, it's sin k h minus i beta times 1 minus cos k h. Similarly, here also there is a imaginary part involved and what uh, does that do is uh, that if you plot the real and imaginary part, the real part looks exactly like what you have gotten in bubnov galerkin method. There is absolutely no difference. So, this figure is exactly like what you would have gotten with the bubnov galerkin method. What uh, differs now is the imaginary part. Because of upwinding, what you would find that you would get a negative value of k equivalent by k. And that is what you are seeing in this uh, uh, black uh, line. This is for the interior nodes. You find that the significant amount of numerical dissipation is added. And please do understand this uh, value of uh, k equivalent by k imaginary, even at the Nyquist limit, you can see this value is something like about 0.3 or thereabout. And if you compare with what we have done in compact scheme, this is hugely dissipative scheme. This is very, very dissipative scheme. Okay? Uh, so, what happens is uh, that should remind you of that uh, when we were talking about uh, error propagation equation, I compared all four methods. I compared 
a CD2 method with a compact scheme, then this SUPG method and that method that is used in fluent, that uh, quick. Okay? And what we found, of course, that the fluent and SUPG actually removed the signal. And that was the reason because uh, of this. If you look at uh, the G path, you will find that uh, depending on beta, uh, G real itself will um, bring down the value from your ideal value of 1. Right? So, if beta equal to 0, then you would not have gotten the second path. So, here in SUPG, that um, attenuation comes through this uh, path, where you uh, deviate severely from its ideal value of 1 via the second term. And of course, you have this uh, imaginary part as well. And uh, having obtained the real and imaginary parts, we can calculate that beta, if you recall. And from beta, we can calculate the CN, the numerical phase speed. And from there, we can calculate the group velocity. And doing all this analysis, Raymond and Gardner uh, did talk about uh, uh, did talk about uh, a better wave propagation property for beta equal to 0.26. I am again going to skip this. You can read it leisurely. This is little more explanation of uh, SUPG as given by Professor Brooks and uh, sorry, Professor Hughes and his student. Uh, and uh, it's, it's basically trying to uh, sanctify the usage of upwinding by claiming that you are adding some kind of a tensor uh, stress law, wow. a stress term. Uh, uh, let's uh, omit that part. So we'll, we'll not uh, talk about that. However, let's uh, come back to the discussion that we were having, uh, namely that. Uh, uh, what is now called as HP element method, which depends on simultaneous refinement of the mesh, that is reducing H and increase in the order of the polynomial P. Okay? So, if, if we look at this, the first candidate would be, of course, what we have uh, done is uh, uh, trying to take the basis function in terms of the quadratic polynomial, and this will uh, be calling as G2 FEM. Okay? So, this is a second order polynomial, the Galerkin expansion, second order polynomial, finite element method. Okay. Uh, so, this we have already seen, the basis functions look like this. Okay. So, we have uh, those three sets of uh, functions. If I uh, do that again, so this is uh, my so, the this is one node. So, this is let us say the lth node and I will have a uh, midpoint. So, this is my L plus one th node okay? and this is the midpoint and this is my L minus one. Th. So, what happens is uh, lth node is defined into three parts. One is this part right? that is given by this uh, middle equation here. This is this path that I just now drew, and the other path would come from here. This uh, will be like this, and here we'll have the third path, which will come like this. That would be like this. Okay. So basically, that uh, the top function is the left one. The middle one is this uh, parabolic uh, curve that we see here, symmetric, and this is that uh, the right hand element. So, this is what you get uh, from <coughs> the quadratic polynomial used in this. Now, what we are going to do is uh, we uh, again look at the wave equation, right? That is our perennial test bed. So, we will use that and uh, note that um, we have. Uh, added a uh, midpoint as the additional node. Right? So, that is what uh, we do that uh, we define a h, which will be nothing but h l by 2. And then we go through this exercise. And this exercise is not uh, trivial, but uh, this is a figure that would actually explain to you uh, how you evaluate the terms. So, let us say I am trying to evaluate the terms for the lth node. So, these are my basis functions. right? This is the middle part, 
is the left part and this is the right part. Now, we will have to see which are the nodes that are going to interact with it to produce a non trivial contribution. For example, for phi L, I will have contribution coming from L minus 1, and uh, that is what it is, right. So, I will have a function which is a parabolic function which is there, and plus the right element that is there. It will also have contribution coming from f of L minus 2, that would come from this path, only the right hand path. Okay. Uh, the other part is of course, uh, here and they do not have common intersection with the LF node. Right? The same way, if you look at uh, the contribution coming from the, the right hand neighbors, you will find that contribution will come from L plus 1 and L plus 2 and this is the way that we will have to uh, uh, find out that there are actually 7 Lagrange quadratic elements and this is the way the functions look like and you would be seeing that if you are looking at the lth node, the contribution is going to come from L minus 2 to L plus 2. So, this is like your CD4 kind of an expansion, right. So, that is what you and you go through all this. Uh, I have given you the detailed step. Please uh, uh, check it that you will find the contribution that would come from the uh, convection term uh, would be like this, right. U L plus J. Uh, we are multiplying by, uh, by phi L, then we will find out that the contribution would come from uh, L plus J, where J will go from minus 2 to plus 2, right. And integral uh, non-zero contribution would come from minus 3 H to plus 3 H, okay. That that is the only thing that we are going to have a non-zero uh, contribution coming from, rest of it everywhere else it will be 0. And once you uh, uh, work it out, you have the expression for those phi L of uh, uh, or phi j's, then you can uh, calculate the derivatives. Now, the derivatives are no more like constant in uh, the linear basis function. So, it would need little bit of calculations, uh, go through it and then you will find that u L minus 2 will be multiplied by this integral i 1, evaluate that integral and you will get 1 6. Uh, <coughs> then you will get contribution coming from u L minus 1, the multiplying integral works out to equal to minus 4 third and you will find that L f node on itself will not have anything, because it is a symmetric function. Symmetric function means you will never have the contribution coming from the central node itself, right. So, that is why I 3 uh, should come out to be equal to 0 and I 4 will be plus 4 third and that is also uh, comforting, because you will see that if you are taking a symmetric function, then it would uh, have a anti-symmetric contribution coming. So, if I 2 is minus 4 third, I 4 will be plus 4 third and if I 1 is plus 1 6, I 5 will be minus 1 6. Okay? So, basically then you will find out that this will give you this and once again now uh, you can clearly identify this is uh, like your C D 4 expansion of del u del x in finite difference method, right. That is what you get. <coughs> now, uh, like uh, what we have seen with uh, linear basis function, uh, the time derivative terms will be much more complicated here, because of uh, the quadratic uh, nature of the function, the weighting will come from these and you can see once again, this uh, term will uh, be con uh, getting its contribution from the nodes at L minus 2, L minus 1, L and similarly, you have uh, this kind of representation finally and we can go through this exercise and we will find out I 1 prime is minus h by 15, I 2 prime is minus 4 h by 15. I will actually send you a uh, sort of a link of a paper where all these things are worked it out, have been worked out by us a few years ago that you can uh, see. Okay, so, what happens is for the central node, the time derivative actually works out like this. Uh, it may look little complex, but uh, that is what it is. So, your discrete equation is this, taking that uh, quadratic. Now, uh, 
Um, what you can do is uh, you will have to also do something more for the near boundary points, right. Near boundary points are a uh, uh, little uh, trickier because you will have to mix first and second order elements, otherwise you will not be able to close it. And we have uh, shown you here, say for example, if we are trying to see how we are going to handle uh, the near boundary points, phi 3 is a regular point because that goes all the way up to uh, uh, 3 by 2 node. Okay? So, this middle uh, segment would be symmetric, right? that goes from 2.5 to 3.5 node, right? and this left node goes from 1.5 to 2.5, the right node goes from 3.5 to 4.5. Now, if I uh, try to extrapolate it on to phi 2, then what will happen? Well, I cannot have a quadratic function here. I cannot have, because that will spill out from outside. So, we cannot do that. So, what we instead do is, we take a mixed element here. So, this part comes from the quadratic side and this is the linear part. And similarly, this uh, phi 1 will take the right hand side element coming from quadratic element, whereas this middle part is replaced by half of the linear element. Why did we do that? Because we have to satisfy that Lagrange property that it should all add up to 1. And that you can see uh, is done very, very uh, adequately. right? So, this is the way that you will have to do. Uh, so, for L equal to 2, we can write similarly uh, this kind of thing that is what we have shown and you will have to go through that exercise and it is a little bit of uh, algebra. You uh, go through it and you find out uh, L equal to 1 this is the discrete equation, L equal to 2, this is the equation and having obtained the discrete equation, we can uh, write out k equivalent by k, right. By using that uh, Fourier Laplace transform, we will get that and then substitute it and let us say we do Euler time integration, we will get uh, this uh, g, the numerical amplification factor like this. Once again, you can very clearly see it is an unstable method because the mod g is going to be greater than 1. However, uh, having obtained that uh, g here, uh, you have the real part and the imaginary part. You can calculate the numerical phase speed by this expression. What is beta 2 j? Beta 2 j is tan inverse of g imaginary by g real. Right? That is what you are going to see. Since g uh, uh, real is 1, so this itself uh, is going to define your beta 2 j. And you can calculate uh, the numerical velocity. Uh, well, that is what I wrote uh, that uh, for beta 1 j, we had this uh, expression. So, we will uh, replace uh, the corresponding expansion from here. Uh, this part would uh, be uh, replaced by uh, this part will be replaced by that expression. Okay? We have now uh, basically the tools all the elements that we needed to uh, have, we can uh, compare uh, various uh, methods and that is what uh, you are seeing here. It is not a very good reproduction, a copy from a paper and you can notice that uh, k equivalent by k for the real path, uh, various methods go like this. All of the um, Galactin methods are clustered together. What is important for us to realize though, that the difference between g 1 and g 2, the linear and quadratic uh, elements, they are not uh, greatly different, they are close to each other. And g 1 and g 2 are uh, basically uh, neutral uh, methods. So, in the interior nodes, the imaginary part is 0, but only the near boundary points you get this. And for j equal to 1, you can for G2 FEM, you get a very, very larger instability, right, uh, because of the quadratic nature. Uh, whereas, the second point, the instability comes down, but still it is uh, in the larger range of cage. Whereas, SUPG, as I explained to you earlier also, uh, gives rise to a massive uh, dissipation. That is what you see here, with a minus uh, value. 
and this, these are the contours that uh, actually Suman uh, did it uh, very recently uh, last week only. So, uh, we uh, plotted all this uh, g contours. This is for linear basis function, this is for the quadratic basis function and this is for SUPG. Um, this, this results are uh, absolutely new and uh, what you notice is uh, that there is a very, very small region where you get uh, close to 1, but nonetheless both these methods are unstable, right. So, what I have uh, uh, shown here is 1.3 zeros. Uh, that does not mean it is neutral stable. It, 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 there is a fourth decimal point involved there. And if you want to go to 6 decimal and 8 decimal, though that point will eventually shrink to the origin itself. So, these two methods essentially uh, going from uh, p equal to 1 to p equal to 2 does not uh, give you much uh, uh, benefit. It is only the maximum value you will see. The instability will be stronger here. Here the maximum is 34, there its maximum is 47. So, it is just that, but anything above 1 is bad enough. So, it does not matter whether you are 34 or 47. So, both these methods are uh, uh, unstable that we know. Uh, this is your SUPG method. It is interesting for one to note that uh, you are actually uh, not allowed to take a very large value of N c, because this is also unstable 1.004, this is 1.05 and so on so forth. And it, it, it is also unstable in this. It is only stable in this vertical strip, but you also notice that uh, it is not neutrally stable, because of that imaginary part of k equivalent by k. Uh, this line is 0 0.999. So, even if you are looking at small values of n c, the solutions are going to be attenuated and that we have seen before. Now, uh, we can uh, compute the c n by c for these three methods. These two once again um, are almost same. So, I do not see any difference between the two. It is uh, the method that is uh, significantly different is that c n by c contour. And you can see there is a small range of k h, small range of k h and small values of n c, where you can get uh, c n equal to c. So, that is uh, that. So, you can realize the utility of uh, S u p g also. <clears throat> and this is uh, what we need to uh, really uh, understand. This is the group velocity features and once again you do not see anything between linear and quadratic uh, version of bubnov galaxy method. It is the SUPG method which you would be interested and you can see that uh, is equal to 1 is a very small strip. Uh, anywhere above you are going to get uh, uh, the energy numerical energy propagating faster. Uh, what you also see is this region, this uh, shaded brown region. This is the region where actually you get uh, that uh, upstream propagating uh, waves, the Q waves that is marked here. So, you can realize that even if you uh, take a very small value of N c, you may end up with a region of uh, k h for which uh, your wave can propagate uh, wrongly. But then this is not an issue. Why? Because this you will have to couple it with your g contours. So, if I look at uh, the g contours here, these are the areas where you would see massive attenuation. So, this is the 0.5 line, right. So, you will not get uh, in actual computation ever upstream propagating waves, but there is this possibility if you excite the flow forcibly in that region with a large amplitude uh, disturbance, then uh, you may actually get this Fourier propagation. Okay, I think uh, this is the uh, this is all that I wanted to tell you about this. Um, so what you real, uh, realize that uh, despite what people uh, have hoped that in HP element that uh, refining H of course helps, but not to uh, a sort of a, a linear estimate. For example, so if I uh, look at it this way that if I keep uh, uh, refining H, I will. Uh, for example, uh, can get in to a range which has to be really very, very local close to the origin. 
to have a usable uh, limit. So, what happens is SUPG uh, continues to be the choice for uh, so called engineering calculation. Uh, we do not consider it to be at all of use, although there are lots of practitioners within this campus itself, uh, <clears throat> but they are of no scientific relevance. Uh, what happens with the Gallatin method? We have uh, this issue of numerical instability itself, right? Uh, given, given all these things taken together, I do not think uh, finite element method is still a strong candidate for scientific calculation. Okay? Uh, whereas, uh, if we go to finite volume method, we may be able to uh, recover the situation in a much better way. Finite difference method as it stands still happens to be uh, the best uh, method of choice. If you are trying to uh, calculate some problems, solve some problems with uh, good uh, uh, accuracy, high fidelity, uh, we still would cast our vote for finite difference method. And that is why I purposely spent most of the semester talking about this high accuracy finite difference method. Okay? Uh, so, this is all that uh, I really wanted to take the uh, finite element method. This is not something what you would uh, find in the books on FEM because they do not uh, talk about waves, but I suppose there would be some monographs on weather prediction where people may talk about it, but here also this picture very clearly reveals that this Petrov galaxy inversions are uh, still uh, a long way off from uh, giving us the kind of accuracy that we require. So, uh, this is something I just wanted to uh, show you that whatever we um, for the disturbance propagation problem, that was the constant theme that we had in this course. So, we started off with defining how waves uh, are central to any computations and then we have uh, focused upon these uh, essential properties and that uh, why are these three properties are essential that we saw from that error propagation equation. Uh, that was one of the key feature of also this course. We wanted to show that what von Neumann uh, uh, assumed that uh, signal and error to be governed by the same dynamics is uh, wrong. Uh, we found out that uh, error propagates differently it is more like a forced excitation problem and those forcing comes through this modulus g term, that is what we see and we have seen that uh, if modulus g is not equal to 1, whether it is greater than 1, of course, that solution blows up. So, you do not have to worry about, you have lost it. So, you know that. The problem comes when you actually have g less than 1, you get some solution which looks plausible, essentially wrong, right. 